depending on how much curiosity you have, it'll affect time. If you don't have a lot of curiosity, it constricts time and you think that things are moving very fast. If you have curiosity like centenarians, they think they have all the time in the world. So it's a, it's a developmental factor rather than something that, that is genetically sentenced. It's not like that at all. So these people are excited about their lives and they have plenty of time for anything. At 105, 105, I asked this, this centenarian, so what do you think of your garden? He had a, a garden. He said, oh, it's really good, but wait till you see it in a couple of years. Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louise, your host, International Passion Ambassador. Thank you so much for watching or listening to us now. I'm so excited about my guest today, Dr. Mario E. Martinez. Dr. Martinez has developed a model to effectively change our beliefs that limit, limit our health, longevity and success. Dr. Martinez is a licensed clinical psychologist who specializes in how cultural beliefs affect the interaction of productivity, health and longevity. He is the founder of Biocognitive Science and the Empowerment Co. Dr. Martinez holds a master's degree in clinical psychology from Vanderbilt University and a doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Madrid. He also has a postdoctoral training in psychopharmacology from Fairleigh Dixon University. He lectures worldwide on his theory of biocognition and teaches empowerment code principles to top US corporate executives and to global organizations in Europe, South America, Africa, and Asia Pacific. This is his story and this is his passion. Dr. Martinez, welcome to Passion Harvest. I'm so honored to have you on the show today. Thank you. I was looking forward to it. It's very good to meet you and to, to share my work with, uh, with your audience. Well, I'm so excited that you're here today. So let's dive right in if you're ready. Um, what is biocognition? It's a word that I had to invent uh, because uh, science looks at mind and body and communication of mind and body and and there's very little doubt that the mind and the body communicate with each other. But what I'm bringing in is the third component, which is culture. The mind and the body do not communicate in a vacuum. They communicate in a culture which has a history of collective beliefs. And those collective beliefs affect our health, our longevity, and the things that I'll be talking about. So really, I'm bringing in mind-body culture as, as a way of looking at uh, human beings interacting with each other and, and with themselves. So is this, is this from our family history, environmental impacts of the culture, basically how our life and our family and our environment? Uh, yes, uh, the culture has tremendous power. I, I, I look at it as a, an analogy would be looking at it, you're, you're in a fishbowl, but you don't know in the, you're in the fishbowl. You think that that's it. And what happens is that we learn our ethics, our aesthetics, our sense of well-being from our culture. And our culture has collective beliefs of what is correct, what is not. And we learn all of that. And then what we become is a cultural self. And in my work, what I try to do is get people to go from the cultural truth to a personal truth to find out what you are rather than what they tell you you are. And that will affect everything. It'll affect uh, your relationships, your, your prosperity, because what you learn is not what you're told by your parents or other people, but it's what you observe. So if you have a father who tries and tries and never makes it and never succeeds, then the bioinformation that you're getting is that no matter what I do, I'm not going to succeed. Even though intellectually, your father may say, don't be like me, but, but we learn by observation early in life. Uh, so it's like riding a bike that's built in. And then there's some things that, that we do that to break that so people can liberate themselves from, from the fishbowl. That's a great way to explain it. I personally, for me, uh, when I went back to study, thought that my thoughts were my own, but in fact they weren't. They were part of my environment and my culture and my family, and I thought these aren't really my thoughts. Yes, very much. And, right. and it's very empowering recognising that. Yes, and, and especially having tools to do it, because there's a lot, as you know, from the work that you do, a lot of good scientific, uh, knowledgeable people out there, but there are also a lot of charlatans that don't know what they're doing, or if they know what they're doing, they abuse people with information. And one of the things that I caution people is that there are no quick fixes. You can't change a history in, in five minutes, but you also don't have to go into psychoanalysis for years. 
You just have to learn some methods and be aware of who's co-authoring your reality with you. Because some people co-author your reality without even knowing it, uh, including uh, illness. People co-author illnesses with each other without knowing it. And, and the, this whole cultural impact, or I guess all the elements, is this what you refer to as the bioinformational field? Yes, bioinformation is another concept that I, I have to pretty much invent. It's, it's a biocognition is a new paradigm, so you have to have a new language to be able to conceive the paradigm. And rather than talking about energy, like a lot of people talk about energy and, um, and um, chi and, and quantum, all of those kind of things are interesting, but they're poetics. They don't really give you very much. They're a bit woo-woo. Yeah, that's right. So <laughs> my information is, is simply going from the cell to the, to the belief system is what the biology does with information. So what your biology is going to do with information, it'll do it at a cellular level. It'll do it at the, at the belief system level, which I'll go into as we move along. But it's really an interaction of information and biology. And that's how, that's how we exist as bioinformational beings, because we're not just biology, we're not just information. We're, we are a, a conglomerate. The way to look at it is that think of a culture, look, look at the world as potential to be anything you want. Uh, it could be a tree, it could be whatever you want. But what the culture does is it weaves a fabric around the world, and what you see is the fabric woven by the culture, not the world. And, and in one place, you see one type of world, and now you see another one, but it affects your mind-body, especially psychoneuroimmunology, which is a big word, PNI, for how thoughts and emotions affect the immune, nervous, and endocrine regulation. So information is knowledge, and knowledge becomes biology. So in essence, our thoughts and our emotions create our reality, create our sickness, our health. Yes, yes, because what happened is, uh, if you uh, look at it uh, developmentally, <clears throat> we, were anim we were basically cavemen and, and women and, and in the forest, not everybody was in a cave, but we didn't have a language and we didn't have a consciousness. So I use a lot of anthropology. We developed a consciousness when two things happened. First, when we started creating trinkets that didn't have any, any function as a, as, a, as a tool, it's just pretty. <laughs> That creates tremendous, that requires tremendous amount of uh, cognition to be able to do that. And second, we started burying our dead. When you start burying your dead, you, you have a consciousness that says there must be something beyond. And, and it's not just burying them, as some people say, because you wanted to be hygienic. Mm -hmm. They were buried with things that were important to the people. So they we were assuming that there's something beyond those kind of things. And then language created something that goes beyond uh, just a, uh, uh, existing and, and, and survival into finding meaning. So then the brain had to become a cultural brain. Before, you could smell the, the pheromones of a, of a lion 300 feet away. But now, you say, there's a lion 300 feet away, the language. But then the brain had to understand that language to have the same stress reaction as smelling the, the language. So then language becomes biosymbolic language. So this is when somebody says to you, you're so stupid and they shame you, you have molecules of inflammation as if there's some kind of pathogen out there. So the immune system is, is cultural and it responds to biosymbols. And just your example about you're so stupid, we hold on to these, this sensitivity of hurt and pains and sorrows and they affect our life. Yes, because we're the only, the only animal that, that ruminates uh, a zebra, after the zebra runs away from, from the lion and has all the, uh, the um, uh, cortisol and norepinephrine and all that, the lion's gone, they go back to eating. We ruminate. We keep the lion in our heads. Somebody has a, a driving, for example, and, um, and somebody gets in front of you and you have, a, you have a stress reaction and you say, oh, that idiot, and you start getting upset. So you keep thinking about it and you can't wait to get to the office to talk about what happened to you. <laughs> And then they I think many can relate to that. Yeah, they out victimize you because you say, you wouldn't believe what this guy did to me. I almost had an accident. And they'll say, well, I had two accidents. So I have to out victimize you. And then all of that is creating stress responses because the brain doesn't know that it's over. Cognition knows that it's over. But if you keep repeating it, since you're a bioinformational field of mind and body and thoughts, 
you're keeping up that, that level of, of, uh, of stress hormones throughout the day. And what does it do? It affects immune function, it affects blood pressure, heart, and all kinds of things. I'm just going to relay it in simple terms for what I'm interpreting, but it's almost like that fight or flight response that, that we hear about, um, which would have been wonderful if there was a, a lion or a tiger chasing us, but we don't necessarily need it in our modern day. Yes, and, but we use it as a forward because we, we've gone from the, the need for survival to the need for meaning. It's very important. I'll say something that, that's a little um, politically incorrect, but I had a, an anthropology professor who was very, very proper. His, his name was Dr. England, and he wore a three-piece uh, three suit. And he said, in the days of the caves, there weren't too many options. You see something, and you either eat it or you fornicate it. Now it's different. Now it's a lot more options mm -hmm. that we have. And so he was basically saying we were very primitive. We had no option to find meaning in what we uh, in what we do in our lives. Now meaning is more important than than the uh, than the survival. Survival we can survive, but meaning. So since we advanced from uh, survival to meaning, your biology also survived and moved on to meaning. So the biology requires meaning now. In fact, one of the most important things about health is for you to have meaning in your life. If you want to get somebody sick in a, in a corporation, you give them a job without meaning and you give them responsibility without authority. Within a few months, they're sick because we're beings that require uh, a sense of significance in what we do, but also to be able to overcome challenges with the right resources. So empowerment is very important in the work that I do, as you mentioned, with uh, Fortune 500 companies, and, uh, and the idea of empowerment is that you have a challenge, and empowerment simply means, it's very misused word, it simply means access to resources to overcome a challenge. That's it. The immune system does that, people do that. If you don't have the access, or you don't use the access, you go into helplessness, and the immune system goes into helplessness also. That's how people get sick when they give them bad news, and, and they don't give them any, any alternatives. Very interesting. And I'm, I'm digressing from all the amazing questions I had to ask you, but <laughs> when we talk about that stress response, you know, now we search for meaning, but we did come from the, from the need for survival. Many people are, I, would, I don't like to use the word addicted, but addicted to that stress response. It's almost like they need it to survive. Uh, yes, they, uh, they, because, because they don't go inward and look for internal meaning then they have to have something that excites them. And, and, and I think the media is very much to blame to a certain degree because the media will look for hype, will look for things that are just so weird. They won't put out news that says, uh, uh, this woman raised her two kids by herself and, and paid for, the, uh, for their college and they're all doing very well. That's bland. But if you say this, this woman did something really bizarre and killed the kids, okay, then that's news. So what you do is you create a desensitization to negativity. There was, there's some psychological tests that you can give. Uh, they started around in the 40s, and they'll give you some really um, aggressive or, or, or very bizarre kinds of pictures, and they'll measure your stress response. Well, they've had to upgrade it many, many times because the stress response has changed. It's no big deal if you see a, a person with a car accident, but now you've got to see more. So you're desensitized to stress, but you don't realize that the body is actually responding to it but you're not picking up on it because you're so desensitized to it that you think that the world is an alarm system and, and you just get up in the mornings, I wonder what battle I'm gonna to fight today. That, that is a mindset that affects your health and your wealth. And why do you, well, I guess, I guess the, the, it, it sells in the media, the very violent um, issues. Why do you think that is? Why do you think people crave that or want that uh, they're, they're being taught to find interest in things that that touch them emotionally but instead of looking for it because look at the difference you you watch in the media somebody get, getting raped mm -hmm. and you will have a tremendous stress response your pupils will dilate you'll have cortisol norepinephrine epinephrine your blood pressure goes up your heart rate goes up and you suppress immune function but let's say that you see someone like Mother Teresa or someone doing something laudable. You have admiration, especially if it's without envy. The, the thing is completely different. You have 
oxytocin, serotonin, uh, endorphins, all of the neurotransmitter that enhance immune function and give you a sense of wellness and well-being. So look at the difference in mm -hmm. how that works. Uh, so the media is really responsible for it. And also people, because you, know, you can certainly turn it off, but we get uh, dependent uh, on media. We get dependent on phones. Uh, if you're not on social media, you think you're missing something. All of that is a cultural collaboration to make money. Not a conspiracy, it's just a way of making money. And I think you've been discussing all of it here, but do you mind just talking about your mind-body code that you've created? Yes, um, that was my first book, was a mind-body code. Uh, and that is uh, looking at what the mind and the body do. They have a code of, of interacting with each other. So I'll give you a very simple example. Wonderful. When you're sitting like you are now and I'm sitting, you could say, I am safe, I am safe. And the body intellectually will respond to that. But the mind-body code for safety that comes from hundreds of thousands of years, epigenetically transferred from generation to generation, is simply to have your back against something solid or knowing that your back is solid, a wall. Because you learn from the caves and whatever that if your back was up to the opening, you could be some animal's lunch or you could be killed by your enemy. So we learn that epigenetically transferred. So if you want to be safe, the mind-body code is <clears throat> make sure that you sit with something touching your back that's solid, or you know that your back is touching uh, or is behind, the, like you, for example, you have a solid wall. Mm -hmm. and, and evidence for that, um, when there were some studies that looked at people who had their desks uh, facing the, the uh, wall or, and people that were facing the, the door. The people that were facing the door would get up more to go to the bathroom, would get up and, 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 and feel uncomfortable without knowing it. The people that had their back to something solid were more able to work uh, in, a, in a more efficient and, and calm way, just from that. So that's one of the examples. So I'm probably not using the right terminology, but from our ancestors, from genetics, we inherit all these traits in the present person that we are. Yes, because um, there's, a, there's an area in biology that's fairly new, well, 40 years, maybe 50 years. Uh, it's called epigenetics, which means beyond the genetics. And, and the thinking was very Darwinian that we only transfer information from the DNA, mm -hmm. from, from the nucleus. And it takes millions of years for that information to change. And, and, and the examples are that we don't look like uh, the Cro-Magnums and we don't look like Neanderthals. But it wasn't known that we also transfer information, non-DNA, not from the nucleus, uh, that actually has to do with survival and meaning. So for example, people that were in Auschwitz and the concentration camps in, uh, in, in Nazi Germany uh, and, and Poland, uh, obviously those people had a very high level of cortisol because they were in a place that they were gonna be killed. Well, they passed that level of cortisol for two or three generations epigenetically. Uh, to their kids and to their, their grandchildren. It takes about two or three generations to clean that up. You can clean it up if you learn how to do it, but if you don't, it's there, and you don't know why you have that hyper uh, alarm about the world, what has been transferred epigenetically. But you also can transfer epigenetically good things, like centenarians, with people who are over 100 years old that I studied all over the world, and I found that uh, the genetics is only 20%. The rest is the cultural beliefs that they have and how they live. That was, that was an amazing study. What was that like study, studying um, people that were over 100? What was the commonality, which you talked about? It wasn't only genetics. Yes. Um, well, as a, as a neuropsychologist, I thought it was going to be genetics. And there's some, uh, also some genes that are called the Methuselah gene and all that. It's not a gene thing. Uh, one gene does not affect many things. So I was looking for genetics. Mm -hmm. And I looked for only centenarians who were healthy. I wasn't interested in looking at centenarians who were just vegetating because that's living without quality. Yeah. So I went all over the world looking at the centenarians. And I found some very specific things that other people have found too. And found that genetics is only 20%. How they live is really what triggers what I call the causes of health. And that's in my second book, The Mind-Body Self, I talk about that. That it's, that it's mind-body culture and that we learn longevity culturally and we inherit the causes of health. So, for example, one of the causes of health that centenarians have 
is that they have a good sense of humor. They've been in bad places. One uh, was in a concentration camp mm -hmm. and they're not Pollyanna. They don't tell you, oh, it was so wonderful. They know how to get angry because um, what, what my mentor, George Solomon called righteous anger means that you have to get angry at the right context, but not be angry all the time. So I asked him, how was it in a concentration camp? Uh, and he said, well, it was really very rough. Those people were terrible. He said, but what I remember is that one of the guards was 19 like me, and he would slip some food in to me, uh, and we became friends. And that's what I remember from, from what was going on from there. So you see, he doesn't take that burden with him. He takes the best of humanity, although he can be angry about it. So it's not Pollyanna, but it's not uh, super negative, not, not gloom and doom. And that's an example. That, that. The other example, uh, and these are things that can be learned, by the way. That's what mm -hmm. I teach in my work, websites and, yeah. and, and workshops and so forth, is that they have uh, what's called um, um, healthy narcissism. And our cultures teach us to be pseudo-humble. If, uh, if I say, I like your hair, someone would say, oh, I haven't washed it in three days. <laughs> um, I like your, your dress. Oh, yeah, it's very old. See, it's, right. it's excusing your greatness. Mm -hmm. Centenarians are not that way. I spoke to a centenarian. She was a beautiful woman. She was 102. And I said, you're a beautiful woman. She said, yes, I am. I've always been beautiful ever since I was a little girl. Oh, I love that. See how refreshing that is. But they have inclusive, what, what I call inclusive um, narcissism, which means that they're not sociopaths. A sociopath would try to abuse your attraction to them. They include you. So I'll give you another example. And I went to Cuba mm -hmm. to study centenarians. There are quite a few centenarians. It has nothing to do with revolution. It's way before the revolution. Right. Uh, so they gave him a party. They treat him like, uh, uh, like superstars. Okay. So he comes up to me, and there, was quite a few, there were quite a few women around. And he looks at me, and he says, have you noticed how the women are looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> so then he says, but you notice how beautiful they are. See, inclusive narcissism. A sociopath would say, look how beautiful they are. Now I'm going to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. They include you in, in their admiration. And that is very healthy. So you want to learn to admire without envy, but also to be able to admire yourself. And when someone says, I love your hair. Oh, thank you so much. I'm glad you noticed. That's it. Uh, and people will say, oh, but you're being conceited. No. Do you want me not to accept the gift you're giving me? And it's a gift. It's a gratitude. And gratitude has immunology. Generosity has immunology. So when someone says, you're so bright. Thank you. I'm glad you noticed. Somebody will say, what? What do you mean? Well, you think I'm bright. I want to be grateful and tell you, yes, I agree. But that has to be taught. That's a cultural change that we do to teach that because cultures will teach you to stay humble so mm. you don't leave the tribe. And it's almost like you're giving permission that that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. To, uh, is it okay? And, and what happens is you, you leave the culture and uh, you come back as a hero. They love you. But after a while, they start putting you down and you have to come back as a failure. Because otherwise, they'll say, you left the tribe and now you don't need us anymore. It, it's all built in but from within the pale. The pale is an old English word. Uh, medieval word that means enclosure, P-A-L-E. And when you're in the enclosure, you're protected from animals, from enemies and everything. But now we still have the enclosure. You still leave. I work with people who are very, very famous and they come from humble backgrounds. And then when they go back to the tribe, at first they like him. And then after a while, I say, oh, so you don't have any time for me. And what they do is they start sabotaging their, their wealth and their well-being so they can go back as alcoholics, so they can go back depressed. Not all of them, but a, quite a bit of, of them that I've seen do that because that's the only way that they can be accepted. And you work through them, th with them through, through this and tell them that it's okay. Basically, you're giving them permission that they can shine. Yes, and, but we, we try to do it because one of the things that we do in biocognition is it's not intellectual. You can't do it intellectual. If it were intellectual, and you're depressed, I would say, come on, don't be depressed. Look at what a pretty day. And you say, oh, you're right. Thank you. Or don't do cocaine because it's going to kill you. Oh, thank you, doctor. I won't do it anymore. Right. It's intellectual. So what mm -hmm. we do is we do experiential work to actually bring archives of memories and things and then help them make those changes based on the mind-body codes rather than intellectually doing it.
So that is very important. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because not an intellectual process. Otherwise, everybody would do it. All you have to do is tell them, hey, look, let me be reasonable with you. And reason doesn't work. Why? Because you learn behavior with mind, body, cultural context. And if you talk about it, that's only one part of it. That's just the mind. You didn't get to the whole cluster. And that's the reason why the change occurs when you do it like, like that, when you do it experientially. And as you did say in the beginning, it's just not a quick fix. It's not, it's right. not, it, no, it it's takes not. time. I love how you're shifting these mind body states. Um, fear is such a big one in our society. I think you call it false humility to humble brilliance. And obviously in the concept of the time, I'd love to go through a few tools that you have, but how do we overcome fear? Well, in simple terms. Well, first you have to find out if it's, if it's functional fear or not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if, if you're afraid uh, to go to a, a, a dark alley in, in a bad neighborhood, that's functional fear. Right. But if you think that wherever you go, you're going to get mugged, that's dysfunctional fear. So you have to find out. Then you have to go back. And we do it sometimes teaching people at a level of uh, not hypnosis, but a, a deeply relaxed uh, state that is, we call it contemplative. So you can go back to the time how they learned their fear. Who taught them fear? Fear is learned. How did you in learn this life, fear? in this life. In this life, right. Yes. What did you learn? And you might say, well, I remember that my mother always used to say that men are dangerous or, or that people want to hurt you. Or, so you learn that and, and you embody it. You mm. embody, okay, how did that feel? It feels, okay, now good. Now, where did you learn courage in your life? And you go back to that archive and you bring, how does it feel to be courageous? And you, you embody that. So then what you do is you teach them to live a consciousness of courage. And courage doesn't have to do anything with uh, being courageous. It has to do with value. So the terrain, for, and nobody talks about this, the terrain of, of courage is value. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, and that's doing things with fear, by the way. Heroes are, are afraid, but they still do it because they value something. So let's say you're, working down, you're walking down a pier and... Uh, and there's some, possibly some sharks, you don't know, but some, and, and, your, um, and your purse falls into the water and you have $20 there. You're not gonna jump because $20 is not enough. But if your child or someone you love falls, you don't even think about the sharks. You, you, you jump because you gave value to what you're doing. Mm. But if you don't give value to yourself, then you can't be courageous about yourself. So what we teach is personalizing value and then that's a terrain of, of uh, courage and courage comes out. We don't change behavior. We create terrains that cultivate the behavior. And um, it's almost recognizing that, uh, I'm not using your beautiful terminology, but that emotional signature of courage and emb embodying that as a yes. feeling. As a feeling, because you, you have to value something. You would die for your country, for a flag or for whatever. Why? It's just a, it's a rag, it's just a piece of land. But when you value that, then it becomes worthy of you risking. And mm -hmm. risking is, is, is courageous. You, you ask a lot of heroes, were you afraid when you, oh yeah, I was very afraid, but it had to be done. See, so it's not, fear doesn't stop you from being courageous. What stops you is the lack of valuation that you give to things. It's so true. Mm -hmm. um, you also talk about... Um, Commitment in relationships, which is such a big one for all of us and yes. the archetypal wounds of abandonment. How do you work through that with individuals? It's such a big thing for many. Well, all of us, relationships with lovers, with others, with family members. Very much. And, and what I found was, again, the anthropology of it is <clears throat> looking at cultures. What, what are the things that, that cultures will, I call them archetypal wounds because they're all over in all cultures. How do they hurt you? How do they wound you? And as you mentioned, there are three, only three, which is good. <laughs> you don't want more than that. Oh, God, okay. <laughs> they either abandon you, they betray you, or they shame you. And each of them has a psychoneurological response. So you can, so let's say you can, you're, in a, you're in a relationship. So what you learn is that whoever shamed you or whatever uh, wound is usually somebody important in your life, a culture editor, a teacher, a uh, teacher a father, a mother, a friend, someone that has love. Mm -hmm. So when you're young and you are um, wounded, you wrap your wound around love. And then love equals shame or love equals abandonment. You speak the language and you look for relationships that you can abandon 
or that you can be abandoned. And you hear people say, well, I've been married three times and every time I've been betrayed. They speak betrayal fluently, not because they want it, but that's what they learn. So in biocognition, we untangle the wound from love to make it pristine again. And each of them has an antidote. So for abandonment is commitment consciousness that you teach. Uh, for shame is honor consciousness that you teach. And for betrayal, which is the hardest, is loyalty consciousness, but to self, not to others. Because someone's, something was taken away from you. So you don't go fix it out there, you fix it within you. And interesting, the one that's been studied the most of the three is shame. That I mentioned uh, shame causes inflammation. And inflammation has been, uh, has been correlated with everything from depression to cancer. Mm. Depression is more related to, to inflammation than serotonin. So uh, I have worked with many, many women uh, with fibromyalgia and I haven't found one that didn't have some kind of a shaming wound from the beginning. They learned inflammation and they learned fibromyalgia. So, and, and the work that we're doing now is that we're beginning to research I've, clinically, I've been able to show it, but now we're going to research it in the lab of how honor is anti-inflammatory. Clinically, I've seen it, uh, uh, improvement in, in fibromyalgia and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other kind of uh, um, inflammatory illnesses like MS and so forth by, by creating an honor consciousness. Because, it, for example, the question is, <clears throat> if one emotion, one negative emotion has some psychoimmunological reaction, why would the opposite of it, that emotion not have also a psychoimmunological reaction? So the biology doesn't look only at the negative, it looks at the positive too. It has positive biology and negative biology. It's just so interesting we're talking about this because I did my own work that I had a realization last week about relationships and abandonment. <laughs> but um, I mean, I just love what you're doing, but do you, whether it's shame or whatever it might be, do you take them back to a time in childhood or when they experience those, the love and the abandonment, for example, and work them through it and change the emotional signature around that? Yes, uh, emotional signature is a good word. Uh, yes, you have to go to the source. Even if you don't remember that source, you have to go to some time. You, you always have to go, go to your emotional archives. They're there. So you go back, when was the first time that you felt shame? And they're even, they have a temperature. Shame is hot, abandonment is cold, and, and betrayal is hot. So they even have a temperature. Um, so you go back and then you bring it in, you embody it. You, embodying is very important so it doesn't stay up in your head. Where do you feel it? Mm -hmm. um, my chest or by my throat? Okay, uh, embody that, experience it, and just allow it to happen. And, and, and pay attention to it and breathe. Don't try to get rid of it, but just breathe. And then it dissipates. But if you leave it there, it'll come back. So you have to have then the antidote. And the antidote for, for commitment is go back to a time in your life when you were committed to something. Not someone's committed to you. You were committed to something that you did. And you did it and you felt really good about yourself. Then when you bring, you bring commitment consciousness in, it, it begins to create an antidote for the shame or for the abandonment. And then you begin to live uh, the commitment consciousness. But... In order to create more neural maps, you have to repeat it. So that means that for the next two weeks, you're going to do commitment consciousness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even the smallest thing, <clears throat> I commit to doing such and such, and you do it. I commit to do it, and you do it. And that is one of the pillars of self-esteem. Valuation self-esteem goes up when you keep self-caring commitments. It goes down when you, when you break self-caring commitments. And the cultures will always teach you to break commitments to yourself. They teach you to be uh, caretakers. So I say, could we go for a walk now? And you say, no, I'm going to do some meditation. Come on, do it some other time. That's okay. You can do it. Oh, no, come on. No, I want to meditate. But if you say you have a migraine, immediate, okay, I'm sorry. We can do it any other time you can. So it's set up that way. Do not let you commit to self or to be, um, to be honorable with self or to admire self. Relationships need to be mutual admiration. You have to admire each other because when you admire each other, uh, admiration epigenetically and, and every uh, developmental way is something that's necessary. We were designed to admire laudable good behavior so it can be imitated. This is why you have the bonding 
oxytocin, peptide, neurotransmitter that actually bonds you. You have it uh, during orgasm, when you're breastfeeding, and when you make a, a connection, not necessarily uh, sexual, just a, a friendly smile that creates oxytocin. So it's set up so you can imitate laudable behavior. But if you don't do it in yourself and you admire other people, then you don't get the benefit. Right. Uh, you're just putting it out. And the other thing that we teach is admiration without envy. Extremely important. And we have some techniques to, to work because if you admire with envy, there's no oxytocin. The immune system knows the difference. You can't trick mother nature. <laughs> Feelings and emotions are so significant as you keep talking about. I just want to touch on you um, mentioned in relationships about the feeling of shame and then you almost flip it somewhat to feeling emotions of commitment. Do you take the person back to that first time that they felt shame and ask them to embrace after they've experienced the shame, ask them to embrace the feeling of commitment, for example? No, because each, each of them has an antidote for, for shame is honor. Okay. For, for, for abandonment of commitment. So honor, so what you do to go back to a time, archives, mm -hmm. when you did something very honorable that you're proud of. You notice that when you're shamed, you're, you go inward like this, and when you're proud, you go out, it, it has a body right. uh, positioning. Uh, and um, so when, when you go back and, okay, when, when was the first time that you did something that's very honorable, even if nobody knew about it, you knew it was the right thing, it was the elegant, appropriate thing to do and you felt very proud bring it back and then you go ahead and you embody it then you act honorably uh, for several weeks in order to to bring it back but if it comes back i'll give you an example let's say that you have shame and it happens you, you have the shame wound so you carry uh, a lot of shame around mm -hmm. and you know when you're using the wound when you over responding to, to something, you're overreacting. You go, to, you go to, to your job and you have a, a board meeting and you're late. And the uh, head of the meeting is a shaming person. And he says, well, there you are again. I can always count on you of being late. And you just feel like it's getting a, a, a tornado going through you. Right. That is a signal that you're over responding because you're bringing your whole history of shame there. So what do you do? First, you stop, you know, shame, you breathe, you let it, let the signature pass through and ask yourself, what is the honorable thing that I need to do now for myself? You ask yourself, and it could be, all right, uh, yes, I'm late and I will uh, take care of that later. Let me talk to you about that later. Thank you. And you said, that's honorable. But once you want to clean up a wound, you have to be assertive. So you don't continue to be abused. So later, in an honorable way, you talk to your boss, and, and, and sometimes you could lose your job, but you know, it's better to lose your job than your health. Uh, and you say, look, I'm, I'm very sorry that I'm late, and I'll make up the, the work, but please don't do this in front of me, uh, in front of other people again, because we're both professionals. Respect me as I respect you. That's honorable. So you have to be assertive to clean up a wound. Otherwise, they keep wounding you. I just, I just love the way you're explaining this. It, sa it sounds so simple, but it is complex. Um, it is. <laughs> a lot of us, instead of, um, well, maybe I'm talking about myself, but instead of um, talking about it, distance themselves from that person. Yes. Is that not going to work as well? Well, it depends. If, if it's someone that you can distance yourself from, it's great because you don't need them. Who would you, why would you want somebody who wants to hurt you? Mm -hmm. But if it's someone that you have to deal with, then you have to do these things because if you don't, they'll continue to do it. And in many cases you can resolve it because you have to do it honorably. You don't go angry to the person telling you don't ever do this. It's, it's an honorable thing. So what you're trying to do is you bring out the best in them and, and say, uh, you could say, if you were upset, I understand. Uh, but uh, I, I really uh, don't, uh, don't appreciate uh, being treated this way. Although I was wrong and I will definitely correct me being late. See, it's, it's a way of valuing yourself so somebody else can value you. So in a way, being assertive is part of the healing process yes. somewhat. So yes. it maybe is an essential part instead of hiding from it. Yes. Uh, uh, assertiveness is really another one of the causes of health. Be benign boundaries. And another example from centenarians was uh, centenarians, I, I, I couldn't teach them anything. They taught me uh, all of I the theory that. that I did. So... Um, but I asked one, 
Um, he was about 101, I believe. And um, he's probably 110 by now. <laughs> Gosh. I mean, they're around for what a long time. What an incredible study. I have to say congratulations yeah. again. It's remarkable. Thank you. So I said, uh, they're, they're very willing to help, but they have benign boundaries. I said, could I interview you Saturday? He said, sure, sure. Um, what time? And I said, nine o'clock. He said, no, nope. at nine o'clock, I have tango lessons. <laughs> right. You see? He didn't say, oh, I'll drop my tango lessons so I could talk to you. Yeah. You know, they, they, they have that healthy narcissism to value themselves. And then he said, how about two o'clock? Two o'clock's great. So he had his tango and he had the interview. Um, obviously, you've touched on this, but the role of the ego, you talk about that as a big one in particularly in relationships. Do you mind just discussing the role of the ego? Yes. Um, the way to look at an ego, again, um, developmentally and, and anthropologically, the ego you don't want to kill the ego, like some people say. The ego is that mask that you have to put on in order to deal with the world. You can't t tell people everything you think. You can't act the way you act at home in public. So you have to have some constraints, some social constraints, and you have to have some um, diplomacy, and you have to have all of that. But when the ego gets to a level where it's no longer serving you, you're serving the ego, then that becomes a problem in relationships because then you begin to um, treat the person as if you're better than they are. Mm -hmm. You begin to, uh, to look for ways to, to be admired without admiring back. Uh, and you get very conceited about everything that you do. Conceit is really not, not the admiration that I'm talking about. Conceit is, is actually based on low self-esteem. People that are narcissistic and conceited, they have, they have a, 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 a self-esteem disorder. And they compensate for that. And you think about him and say, no, this person can't have any low self-esteem. Look at the way they act. It's a compensation for their lack of self-esteem. So it's really a mask that you know it has to be a mask and when to use it and when not to use it. <clears throat> it's always in the service of the higher self, not the other way around. I need it here, but I don't need it here. Here I can be completely open and safe. And that's what relationships are about, what I call the the covenant of safety you create safety so both of you could be open with each other and both of you can bring wounds if you have them and work them out so if you're in a relationship and you have a, a shaming wound and your partner has a, an abandoning wound you you talk about it and you realize that that if you don't deal with it you'll use each other and you manipulate without knowing it. so abandonment and shame whatever they require a relationship of commitment and honor to interrelate, that's a language that you create. And it begins to heal the wounds on, the, on their own. And if you make a mistake, you stop, no, look, uh, this is not honorable. This, this is what I need from you right now. So it takes working and cultivating the relationship, but not everyone is willing to do that. There's some people that come into relationships to be served and they don't care and that's it. Mm. Or to use you or not have to invest. So relationships are complicated because they require two people that want the same thing, which is to grow together. Yeah, I mean, it's just so simple, but I mean, it's obviously a bit of work, but embodying those yeah, signatures the is the way forward. That's right. And you have the tools. And, and where, did I, where did I study that? Basically, good science, you have to go to what works and then develop theories about it. You don't want to go to... Uh, uh, talking about longevity with people who live 40 years. You go to what works, which is the centenarians. I did the same thing with relationships. I studied relationships that were together for 30, 40, 50 years. And I looked at factors that they had. And one of the factors that they have is they're still excited about each other. They still laugh about each other's jokes. They still have dreams that they want to fulfill with each other. It doesn't end with time. Another uh, myth that we debunk is that you're told, even uh, gerontologists will say, you, as you grow older, you're going to feel like time is passing faster. So that's what it is. That's growing older. Right. That's bad science. What's happening is that depending on how much curiosity you have, it'll affect time. If you don't have a lot of curiosity, it constricts time, and you think that things are moving very fast. If you have curiosity, like centenarians, they think they have all the time in the world. So it's, it's a developmental factor rather than something that, that is genetically sentenced. It's not like that at all. So these people are excited about their lives and they have plenty of time for anything. At 105, 105, I asked this, the centenarian, so what do you think of your garden? He had a, a garden. 
He said, oh, it's really good, but wait till you see it in a couple of years. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> um, I, I love that. So just relationships is such a big one, but people often talk about the honeymoon stage in the relationships and then it kind of filters out and they don't have the same respect and love anymore that they did. What, how would you describe that? Because that's exactly the same thing. They already know that this honeymoon effect. And after a while, they can, that, that's the, the, the part of uh, you put out your best and then later, finally, your ego comes out, which is selfish and conceited and insensitive. So what you want to do is the honeymoon never ends. You stay in honeymoon, like, like Steve Jobs would, would say, uh, our company will, will, will always be on startup. We're hungrier than anybody else. We're always learning about relationships. You stay in the honeymoon effect. And that's what uh, my colleague uh, Bruce Lipton talks about, the honeymoon effect that you, uh, you, 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 you explore. But the whole idea is that you have to explore your dreams with each other. Even if you don't fulfill them, you have to explore them. You have to respect each other. You have to give each other time to express each other. Uh, you have to keep a sense of excitement about each other not only physically, but in intellectually in every other way. And you have to be able to be open enough to talk about things when they're getting boring. What I call the, 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 the uh, curiosity plateau, the novelty plateau. Let's say, I'll give you an example. You, you, uh, your partner, uh, you work at home and your partner works out and it's raining and snow and snowing and sleeting and all that. And you say to your partner, oh, you can go out and dance in the rain and the snow. And you laugh, oh, that's funny. But then every time your partner goes out, oh, you're gonna dance in the rain. They'll say, why don't you go out and dance in the rain for a while? See, it, 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 it's a novelty plateau. You can't replay it because it's not contextually relevant. It's not funny anymore. So I have to come up with something new. And the reruns are the thing that make people feel that the honeymoon effect is over. So keep finding new creative yeah. ways to and, explore the relationship and, and find out what you did when you were together first <clears throat> and what you're doing now. You have to have exciting rituals. For example, rituals are another cause of health. Uh, a ritual of we go out to dinner every Sunday night or we work, we eat at home with candlelights and look at people at restaurants, couples that have been together for a long time and they're not really that happy. Yeah. And you see, they don't even talk to each other. I know. I see that. And I think, my gosh. Yeah. Or they, like with their, their laptops or whatever. And you see people that they talk to each other, they're excited, they laugh. You know you're in trouble when your partner doesn't laugh at, at, at your uh, jokes anymore. That's the beginning of the end. Okay. Watch <laughs> so you out for that one. Or, or that. <laughs> Thanks for explaining that. And, and I just want to touch on what is, what is your guardians of the heart? Or is this all incorporated? in what you've been talking about? Yes, Guardians of the Heart is the model that I use for relationships, which mm -hmm. is that you give literally, and, and, and well, not literally, but symbolically, you give your heart to your partner to take care of it for you. And your partner gives you his or her heart mm -hmm. for you to take care of it. So it's a major responsibility here. And you take care of it by healing each other's wounds and your own wounds. And then you create what I call a covenant of safety, where you can actually talk about things before they become a problem. Let's say, let's look at something difficult here. Let's say a partner says to uh, his or her partner, um, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm really a little concerned here. I've been looking around and I've, I've been feeling some attraction to other people. What can we do about that? Instead of not talking about it and suppressing it and then doing it later. Right. Betraying, so that's a, that's a precursor to betrayal. So you talk about it, well, what is, what's going on? Well, uh, we used to be very excited about each other. We used to do things together that were exciting. And, and by the way, good sex comes from good relationships because after a while, good sex becomes really monotonous. Uh, so then- It's, it's not about the sex at the end of the day. It's about that's the right. It's not about the sex. And, uh, and you might say, well, look, I'll tell you, you don't shave anymore and, and you've gained some weight and you don't take care of yourself anymore. So let's commit both of us to take care of our bodies, to, to, to look good as if we wanted to look good for, for our first date. And you also have to take the ego out because you say you gain some weight and your ego says, oh, how dare you? <laughs> right. So you have to get the ego yeah. out of the way. My mother was Spanish, French, and she would tell you as things were because she was very existential without knowing it. 
she would say to somebody, oh, you've gained some weight. I said, why would you say that? Because she did. She knows she gained some weight. So I'm saying it as, a, as an statement. So then I was trying to use psychology with her and it wouldn't work because I say, okay, what if somebody said that you're ugly? Would you like that? She said, I've always been ugly. I don't have any problems with that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, so there was no was, ego there. That's right. No ego. And she almost was a centenarian. She lived to 97. Wow. So. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I've just got another question, and this is probably a big topic, but I'm interested from your perspective. Why are we attracted to certain people and not others? Because we're, we learned the, the intimate language of love from, from our parents and from people that, that we knew early. And if it just happens that, let's say you learn the, 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 uh, the abuse language of love, which is mm -hmm. uh, shaming or, or abandonment, uh, emotional, physical abuse. You learn that. So without you knowing it, even though you don't want it, you speak abuse and you find someone that has to abuse you a little bit emotionally or intellectually or whatever for you to feel at home. You find somebody that, that, that doesn't abuse you and treats you well and you don't know what to do. So I had a patient, this is an extreme, but she came from a very abusive uh, family. The father abused her and of course she found a husband that abused her. So we were working on it and one day she comes in and she said, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I think my husband might be having an affair. I said, why is it? He hasn't beat me up in two months. Gosh. You see the pathology? Yeah. Uh, because that's, that's the intimate language that we learn. So if you, find, if you want somebody with all the qualities that, that, that you're looking for, make sure that you're not um, in any way bringing something in that needs to be worked out first. So for example, if you want someone to treat you well, look back and see how you were treated to see if, if you're looking for how you were treated badly or how you can break away from that and create your own uh, individuation and then get out of the tribe, get out of a, a pale and begin to demand what you didn't have when you were a little girl. But it takes work with each other. And, and it's exciting. If we, if we learn to do it, it's very exciting. I work with couples and they find it very exciting to, to learn these things because they grow. Mm. Yeah, I love, I love that explanation. You also talk about why, why it's so difficult to achieve lasting change. Why is that? Um, well, because we, we, we learn, um, there, there are three levels of learning, the way that I look at it, developmentally and so forth. But babies or children or infants learn their disciples of pain. They learn by pain. They touch something that's hot, they don't touch it anymore. They, uh, they do something bad and they get spanked or they're told, uh, and, 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 and so they, it's pain, pain. Then you go to the next level, and the next level is skeptic of joy. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I feel good, but that's because happiness. Happiness is not sustainable. Uh, so that's what you do, skeptic of joy. Some people are stuck in the first, which is I can only learn through pain. Others are stuck in the... In the uh, the ones that doubt and skeptics, yeah, this is good, but when is, when is this going to end? And then the masters of abundance, which is what I teach, is that there's joy in everything that you do, not in good or bad, but extracting the wisdom of whatever's happened. So a lot of people, and it's all in the language, say people, you say, how are you doing? So far, I'm doing okay. So far, I'm doing okay. It's like it's not going to last. So the change that's sustainable is when happiness, for example, happiness is not something that you can control. Happiness is fleeting. And you don't want happiness, you want joy. You buy a new car, you're happy. You wreck it, you're not happy. But when you extract the joy of things, of what you're doing, even if it's something bad, you extract the joy. Not Pollyanna, how wonderful, but what is the, what is the meaning of this? Mm -hmm. Meaning and joy come together. And joy and a sense of, uh, of belongingness come together. So you forget, for example, when I work with executives, tell them, look, forget about getting your employees to be happy. Forget it. You could have, a, it doesn't translate to production or a wealth or health because you could have a very angry, unhappy person who's very, very effective or you could have someone who's very happy and very lazy. So happiness is not a predictor. Meaning is the predictor. You don't give them happiness. You give them meaning. So with meaning, they can find joy. So it terrains rather than behavior change. And this is also what relates to your ceiling of abundance, in essence. Yes, yes because you could be abundant. I remember I, I, I was living in Miami, 
<clears throat> a friend of mine uh, told me that we were going to visit this man who was a, a baritone uh, singer from, from Cuba, and he left Cuba because of the uh, revolution and all that. And he was living in a very poor neighborhood, very, very modest neighborhood. And we went to his place, like a little studio, and you would walk in and it felt like a mansion. He had a little candle and he had a, 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 a very old Persian rug, a piece. He would offer us tea. We felt abundant there and the guy's living in a terrible neighborhood. Yeah. But you could go to a mansion and feel tremendous deprivation. And cold. So it's what you take with you. Yes. Yeah. I love that. This conversation has been so insightful. I've asked all the questions. Is there something you'd like to share with the Passion Harvest audience that I haven't asked you, Dr. Martinez? Well, I think you covered pretty much very well. <laughs> we uh, covered a lot. What, what I would like to do is to see that, to look at that you come from cultures and some cultures, uh, for example, cultures that have had a lot of negative things happen in their lives. Like for example, Poland and Japan and places like that that have had the Nazis and the communists, they have what, what's called uh, avoidance of uncertainty. Other cultures like the United States and Australia and, and UK have uh, a more willingness to risk uncertainty. So if you have a culture that tells you, and, and, and it's in the fishbowl, you don't even have to be told, don't risk, then you're gonna live a life that is gonna be quite mediocre. I don't mean risking and doing cocaine or anything, but, but yeah. intelligent risk. So that's important in growth. You have to grow. Uh, it's not like Freud said that, that developmentally you stop after you, you reach adulthood. You keep developing until the moment you die. So find out what your culture says, what you, were lear what you learned, and how you can individuate, how you can become an individual, even if your culture doesn't accept it. But then, since we're social beings, you have to find a subcultural wellness that supports your new way of being. If you say, I'm so glad that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 40 and I'm going back to school and, oh, that's wonderful, as opposed to, well, you gotta start saving for your retirement. See, mm -hmm. a damper, it, it, the cultural portals that they put you into. Never allow yourself to go into middle age. Middle age doesn't exist. You find <laughs> out when you die. <laughs> what's middle age? You find out when you die. Right. When you ask centenarians, what's middle age? I don't know. Uh, and what do your doctors tell you when you talk about those things? I don't know because they're all dead. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so they they live agelessly. That's wonderful. Oh, it's been such a delight to have you on the show, Dr. Martinez. Where's the best pe Where's the best place for people to contact you? I think the website is, is a good start. Uh, biocognitive.com, uh, biocognitive.com, but also. I have a tremendous amount of information on my YouTube uh, channel, Dr. Mario Martinez, YouTube. And I have over 120 free videos there about my work and techniques and, and topics. But make sure, make sure that if, if you go, that you subscribe so you can have access to it and, 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 and the latest information that we put up. Fantastic. And, and all the, your links will also be in the show notes. Dr. Martinez, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. I, I can't wait to re-listen to this interview. It's been so insightful. My pleasure. And, and thank you for the work you do. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Enjoy. Goodbye. Bye. That's very nice. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.